this uh, Tuesday morning and it's the last day of evolution, I think I'll start with the take home message of my talk. <laughs> and uh, that is that uh, I would like to show that some of the mechanisms that drive uh, evolution, such as inheritance, uh, selection, and trade offs between life history traits, can actually feed into disease ecology to uh, drive long term population dynamics in host and parasites. And uh, I'm going to do that using the Gitsum of Kulu virus system uh, as a model system to understand this. Uh, and basically, what happens here is that as gypsy moths uh, emerge from the reds, they accidentally consume a virus that's in their surrounding environment that leads them to die on leaves and, uh, and foliage. Uh, other healthy individuals come uh, later on to <coughs> feed on these infectious uh, or contaminated leaves. They die and they further spread the virus in the environment. And so we have pretty strong. Uh, evidence that there is strong selection for survival on these uh, larvae. Uh, but we also know that these interactions lead to very important population dynamics. Uh, and so we don't really have uh, good data for uh, gypsy moth abundance over time in nature, but we can use a proxy measure such as uh, uh, amount of land defoliated uh, to kind of observe that uh, gypsy moth display the boom bust uh, population cycles over time. We also know that at low population uh, densities, uh, gypsy moth abundance is basically regulated by uh, generalist predators, such as the white-footed uh, uh, mouse here. But like what, what drives these, these dramatic increases and decreases in population cycles is actually the interaction with these virus. So, I apologize for putting equations up, but uh, I hope they serve to illustrate the process. Uh, classic ecological theory has kind of explained these uh, interactions between hosts and pathogens using uh, a set of differential equations where you can actually track uh, healthy individuals and pathogens over time. And what's important about these, uh, these equations is that uh, the rate at which we convert a healthy or we convert healthy individuals into pathogens is going to be determined by the infection risk, uh, shown here with the Greek letter nu. What's also important to keep in mind from these equations is that the total number of healthy gypsy moths at the end of the season uh, is going to be determined as well by this parameter V, which is a coefficient of variation in infection risk. And so from uh, these sets of equations, we can then estimate or calculate the number of infected individuals at the end of the season that, uh, that then gets fed into a long-term population model that contains uh, host reproduction. Uh, and this is the model that classically we've been using to predict uh, these population dynamics. Now there's a problem. And the problem is that when we go out to the field and we estimate this parameter V, we usually get values that are greater than one. And that's a problem because when you then run these long-term population models, you get dynamics that look like this. So here we're seeing that uh, populations are actually going towards a stable equilibrium. They're not cycling over time. So basically, these models are not very good at, at explaining our data. And part of the reason that we think this is a problem is because uh, these models assume that infection risk is basically uniquely determined by uh, environmental variation. That means that at each new uh, generation, uh, the transmission risk just basically resets itself. It doesn't change over time. So to address this problem, we uh, developed some new theory. Uh, uh, and basically, we made two big assumptions here. And the first assumption is that uh, the risk of, in of infection is uh, going to be costly to reproduction. There's a trade-off between reproduction and, the, and infection risk. And so as infection risk decreases and individuals are more resistant, they're also less fecund. And this is convenient because 
we can use a simple measure such as uh, female pupil weight uh, to, uh, to measure fecundity. As you can see from here, it predicts quite well the number of offspring in the subsequent uh, that each female can produce. Uh, and then the second key assumption that we're making is that now infection risk changes over time. And this change is actually going to depend on the heritability of infection risk. And uh, we can talk about how we arrive at these equations later on. These they might look confusing to some people. Yeah. Uh, and so to test these two assumptions, we did, uh, or uh, yeah, I designed a quantitative genetics experiment in the field. Basically, I made uh, 37 half seed groups, which uh, I then exposed to different virus uh, densities uh, in, in the field. Uh, basically, what you do is that you introduce a bunch of collaborators that, that die from virus into, into bags, and you do that at different densities. You then introduce healthy individuals into that bag. Uh, you let them feed on those leaves for about seven days. And then you get your friends, your families, and their friends to help you bring those bags back to the lab so you can monitor uh, who survived and who died uh, from the virus. And so from here, we can actually estimate uh, you know, what's the variance among uh, the haptic groups to get at this genetic effect. Uh, but another convenient uh, feature of this model <coughs> is that we know exactly how much virus there is in the environment because we manipulated that. And so, and, uh, and so we can actually simplify these equations to produce this simple ex expression here where basically you're only left to estimate two parameters, the infection risk and these coefficients of variation. We then take this uh, standard quantitative genetics approach to define infection risk uh, to vary as a function of sire effects, maternal effects, and other environmental effects. And uh, we estimate the heritability of infection risk using maximum likelihood. And when we do that, we get this. And this is super cool, because basically what it's saying is that infection risk, as defined by these traditional ecological models, uh, varies due to additive genetic variation. And, and so, at some point, I was like really having nightmares about this lower uh, coefficient, <laughs> this lower band. So, uh, we also can show that with uh, model selection criteria, that models that include the sire, dam, and other environmental effects explain the data a lot better than uh, models that do not include any of these effects, and also than a model that excludes the sire effect. So, we have three convincing evidence that infection risk does uh, vary due to additive genetic variation. And what's also really cool is that we also have evidence to show that there is a trade-off between infection risk and fecundity uh, as measured by female pupil weight. And again, these data are kind of noisy, uh, but uh, when we compare models that exclude this slope, we also uh, show that they perform less well, they don't explain the data as well, compared to models that include this low. So basically, these results mean that the two key assumptions of the new theory are met. We have genetic variation for infection risk, and we have a cost of infection risk uh, on fecundity. And then we can take these parameter estimates and plug them into our long-term population model, and we obtain cycles that look like this. So on black, we have the host population varying over time, and then on gray, we have the pathogen population. And uh, what's cool about this is that when you look at the characteristics of these cycles, such as like the periodicity, that is the time it takes from <coughs> two, two peaks, and when you also look at things like the magnitude of these cycles, they actually fall within the range of uh, gypsy moth population cycles that we see in nature. So our model is kind of helping to explain those cycles. But we can also push this model a little further to kind of predict how infection risk is going to cycle over time, and also how, the, for example, the fraction of infected individuals is also going to change over time. So 
that was super fast, but I would probably like to uh, say that it's kind of difficult to separate uh, evolution from ecology from in this system at least. And of course, that's going to depend on the system that you're studying. Maybe uh, the effects uh, change, right? Uh, depending on the system. But maybe uh, uh, when we're trying to understand population dynamics, we should maybe consider how uh, reasonable ecological and also evolu evolutionary assumptions uh, play into this. And with that, I would like to thank my sponsors and we'll take questions. just after an epidemic or just before an epidemic or time mm -hmm. and you see that those that are, were collected after an epidemic uh, and you measure their like egg mass size uh, they're a lot smaller than those uh, before an epidemic so there's kind of like like that trade-off idea with reproduction is kind of evident there uh, but the data is not very convincing <laughs> 